Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ali, and uh, I work at PunchCard. I <clears throat> work mainly with React on the front end and .NET on the back end. And uh, today, I'll be talking about TypeScript. Um, it will be an introduction, plus um, I think Ian uh, gave a talk on TypeScript two months back, and he covered most of the features. I'll be talking about most used features, most useful features, and uh, I'll be showing you why it really shines when it comes to big projects. So a quick introduction to TypeScript. Um, it is a typed superset of JavaScript um, that has optional type information on top of it. Uh, JavaScript is a type language, the only thing being that the types are checked at code execution time. TypeScript brings that step back at compile time. Um, it is maintained by Microsoft and open source, uh, who introduced TypeScript as JavaScript that scales. Um, most of the apps that we build uh, using our frameworks are transpiled anyways, so why not just add a step where we statically type check our code? So this is what TypeScript is about. Um, it appeared in 2012, and uh, these are Google search trends, and it remained pretty dormant for a while um, until 2015, 2016, where a certain text editor was launched as well. Um, plus, um, Angular adopted TypeScript uh, when they moved from AngularJS to Angular 2, so they made TypeScript their default. Maybe they, that had a hand in its rise, but after 2016, it's it's on the rise. A um, lot of uh, developers uh, give high praise to it, and it's been adopted uh, in many, I guess, frameworks. So, for example, Vue 3 is now completely rewritten in TypeScript, plus Node's next iteration, uh, Dino, is both a JavaScript and a TypeScript runtime. Quickly going through the basics, is this visible to everyone? Okay. Um, since it builds on top of JavaScript, it has its uh, same type. So we have string, number, boolean. There is an any type which, rep which represents all the types. Then there is, we can type our objects, we can type our arrays. Uh, and then we have the usual suspects undefined and null. Uh, we can type our functions. So type information, type annotations comes after a parameter list, which is the return type, and inside after each parameter after a colon. So for example, prime factors here is a function that takes in a number and returns a list of numbers. Uh, this function right here, uh, it returns nothing, so we say it returns void. Another feature of TypeScript is uh, type aliases, where we can create, give our types a new name. Uh, one of the best features of statically typed languages is uh, union types, some types, algebraic types, uh, whatever you call them. So for example here, type awesome languages can only be one of these string literals. Anything else will result in a compile time error. We type our objects using interfaces, they come from Java, C sharp. Uh, the difference here is that they are structurally typed. So uh, if any object matches these properties, it will be considered of, of type I person. For example, I'm defining an object here, and it has name and languages property. But notice that the age property is missing because on line 15, we are saying that it's optional. Uh, also notice that I have used my type here. So languages is a list of awesome languages, which is a, can only be one of these string literals. Um, we can define enums, which allow us to define a set of constants. Uh, there's also generic types, uh, where they represent, they represent a variety of values that can come to the function. So for example, the sort function here declares a type T. It takes in an argument which will be a list of T, of that type T, and it will return a list of T. 
promises as well as classes can also be generic types. So why TypeScript? Um, these are some of the benefits that I think we get when we use TypeScript. Um, I'll be presenting a few code examples, so these will be a recurring theme, but I guess if I were to choose one for today, it will be the, nat the fact that type act as a documentation layer on top of our code, and they really make our code readable and easily understandable, especially if you're working with multiple developers, where each one has its own style. It also gives us some cool editor features, some of which I'll be presenting. So this is a React component, and uh, looking at it, uh, uh, it's hard to tell how many props it takes, where the props are coming from. It's hard to tell, uh, it's hard to tell what each state item is supposed to be, how many values it, they can take. Just reading, and then if I add all the code here, which may well be 200, 300 lines long, then it becomes very, very hard for a first time reader to just decipher what is going on in this component. And then, um, a typical React app has like hundreds of components, so it becomes really hard to track what each state item is, where it's coming from, where, where the props are coming from. So with TypeScript, we can add type information. The component now begins down here. All this is type information. So going through this, you can see props and types of props. They're defined here. We define them as an interface. So we know there are three props and they are of any type. Uh, we know number and types of each state property. So for, as an example, sequence here will be a list of colors. And what is colors is defined right here. It can only be one of these values. Anything else will be an error. Uh, and the best part is that this is code plus documentation. So this is documenting our code while we write it. We can also type our functional components, but the state here is embedded inside the component, so it may not be visible, but this, if this component is properly typed, the state is checked all the time. Props are defined right here. So we can clearly see all that it, has, it takes four props and all of them are required, and we can see their type. We can also type our functions and helpers. So for example, uh, Handle quantity change here takes in an event and returns nothing. So what this gives us is it promotes design by contract, uh, which means that when I write a function and type it, the next developer knows what I meant by, what I, what I meant the purpose of that function was. Uh, it helps us identify things like the argument a function takes, what are the types, what are the possible values, and the return type. Uh, it helps immensely during refactoring. We're re just reading the types. You can know what the purpose of a function is. So for example, handle quantity change here takes an event and returns nothing. So we know that it must be performing some side effect, maybe a state update or an API call. On the other hand, get products here takes in a string and returns a list of products. So it may be, uh, it may be filtering a list of products, selecting a list of products, but looks like it is a pure function. And uh, a bad example here is this select category function, which takes in no argument and returns nothing, so we can't tell what is going on in there. We want to write our most of our code like get products, which is a pure function, as it, uh, it is atomic, it clearly shows us what is going on inside that function, as opposed to select category, where no one knows what actually is going on inside, unless we read the code. Uh, one of the biggest advantages of statically typed languages is, is that they catch most of our runtime errors at compile time. Uh, TypeScript can uh, do that without us specifying types, since they are optional, So because the compiler can infer types. So let's see a quick example here. These are three lines of JavaScript code, and uh, as they stand, they are a runtime error. Um, let's see how TypeScript, how typing it helps us. 
So same code, but now I've included the information that courses will be uh, a list of course details, and the constant course will be one of the course course details which you're trying to find using the find method. And TypeScript is complaining. You can see the red squiggly. So let's see the errors. It's saying that property type does not exist on type course DTO. So we define our type an object, and that type property is not there on the object. And the second error is that it's complaining that we're not handling the case where find returns undefined. So array.find can return undefined. But here we're on line 11, we're saying that course can only be course DTO. So it's complaining that, hey, you are not handling the case where course can be undefined. And hence, this, on the last line where we're trying to access a property, it could result in a runtime error. Uh, so even if I remove the type information there, it's still complaining. So TypeScript is inferring the types and uh, it's telling us here that object is possibly undefined. So the property access is unsafe and if this code is run, this could, run, uh, this could result in a runtime error. <coughs> so what we can do here, uh, we can tell the compiler to shut up uh, by using the assertion operator, the bang operator after course. So what happens after this is our responsibility. This will result in, result in a runtime error. Or we can use type guards where we exclude the possibility of course being undefined in an if block. So inside that if block, TypeScript knows that course will always be defined and we can safely access the ID. Um, TypeScript has a feature where we can define function overloads. Function overloads mean that functions have different output based on the type of input. So here, uh, just to summarize the code, if I give it a diesel car object, it will return, give me a cetane number. If I give it a petrol car, it will give me an octane number. And this is all taken care of by the types here. It uses interfaces and a mixture of generic types and also the ever useful sum types. Fuel is a sum type, which is diesel or petrol. So let's see how it goes when I type the code. Notice that uh, the Visual Studio code is telling me that, for example, in that if block, it knew that it would be a, a diesel car, so it, the property access was a cetane number. And in the else block, it knew that the car would be petrol, so the only property I could access was an octane number. I couldn't access cetane number in the else block. This is another example of a runtime error. Uh, maybe you can tell what, it, it, what is wrong here. Something to do with destructuring. Uh, maybe you cannot, maybe your teammate can find it or not, but we need a better way to tell if this is a runtime error. So if I add type information here, which is just an interface, and then telling our function that the object that it receives will be of type I user, TypeScript is immediately recognizing the error that something is wrong here. And it's complaining that uh, it expected a name property to be present in the I user, whereas the object that we're providing it doesn't have a name property. And it catches that before we run our code. So if I fix this, uh, Notice that the object that I'm passing in the function, nowhere have I said that it is of type I user. Yet TypeScript is not complaining. This is an example of structural typing, where as long as uh, name, number, and types of the properties of two objects match, they are considered to be of same type. So that object that I'm writing right in function call is considered to be of type I user. Um, another example, where TypeScript saves us. So focus here is on authorization wrapper component. It takes in two props, types and permissions, and there is a typo in one of the permission array string literals. Um, let's see how TypeScript helps us in catching that error. So we can define categories of those string literals using enums. So here I'm saying that all these string literals 
will be of type admin permissions. Down here I'm saying that all these string literals will be type client permissions. And then on line one, I'm defining a sum type where I'm saying permissions can only be either admin permissions or client permissions. And now they're turned into constant. So when I define this component, I declare the prop types here in the interface. I say permissions can only be a list of those permissions. And the type prop can only be one of auth wrapper type, where auth wrapper type can only be one of these string literals. Nothing else is allowed. So let's see how it helps me when I'm writing the component itself. So as I write, notice how Visual Studio Code is showing me all the possible values and the only possible values based on uh, the type information we gave us. Now in, the, in that if block, disable will not be available, only the rest of the properties will be available. Similarly, when I use this component, uh, TypeScript is complaining that I'm missing some props. The red squiggly there. And as I type this, now again it shows me all the possible values of that type. I don't have to go back to look at the, at the definition of the prop, uh, of the component. And now in the permissions, the only allowed values are defined inside that admin permissions enum, and now this, this removes any possibility of a typo or an error arising from incorrect string literal. Uh, another cool feature enabled by TypeScript in Visual Studio Code is that I can quickly destructure my objects, so here as I destructure them, notice how Visual Studio Code is telling me all the properties that exist on that object. So for example, look at this, all the properties that, of, that exist on current organization, again, uh, this excludes, uh, this, I guess, just rules out any possibility of error here. Another feature of Visual Studio Code is, so if I ever need to find out what the type of an object is, I can control click my way through, and here I can see that the type definition that I defined here, and then I can go back and look at some other objects. So uh, here I'll go to definition, current organization is of type organization DTO, and I can control click my way through the definition, and I can see all the properties here. Uh, here is another feature, I guess this is well known by now, where we can rename our symbols. So Visual Studio Code is using TypeScript under the hood to tell which uh, the, all the instances of the variable and we can rename it in one click. Uh, I'm not sure if this happens in JavaScript as well. I haven't used it in a long time, but if it is happening, it is because Visual Studio Code under the hood uses TypeScript compiler to type check our code, our JavaScript code as well. Another feature where Visual Studio Code helps us is just defining all the types for us. So I can, I can right click on the, I, I can click on the bulb and ask Visual Studio Code to infer types for us based on the usage. So it's using Visual uh, TypeScript compiler to recognize what the types of the parameters would be. Um, these are all the interfaces that are, def that are defined in our, one of our projects. Uh, they are mostly defined, some of them are defined on the front end, client side, but most of them are coming from our server. So, uh, and they permeate all of our client side code. They represent sort of business logic. They represent our documentation. They represent the whole data flow throughout our app. So when we usually discuss code during reviews, during, during meetings, we often find ourselves discussing code in terms of these objects. Uh, you can actually identify each piece of code, each piece of object, each array in your, in your front end code because 
uh, most of it is documented here in this type definition. It's a huge file, at least 1,500 lines long, but it contains all the business logic of our, of our, of our app. Um, let's quickly go through some of the criticisms of TypeScript and why people are hesitant to use it. Learning curve, um, I don't agree with that uh, <laughs> because it, uh, because it is built on top of JavaScript types, right? Anything, these are the features that I've presented here are the most used ones. I don't think we have seen anything odd or anything, any new concept here except for generics, which if you're using, if you are the user of a library, you just need to be aware of them. If you're writing a library, then it's a different case, but for most of our use cases, uh, TypeScript is pretty similar to JavaScript. Uh, conflicts with existing libraries. Uh, it may happen that you may find you may, you're using a library which doesn't have type definitions for it, so you can define them. Your, you can define them, or uh, there are projects like Definitely Typed, which has type definitions for over 5,000 libraries. So you don't need to do anything there as well. Uh, it's highly unlikely that today a library will be there which doesn't have type information. Uh, just another fad. Uh, it's been there since 2012, and uh, and it's gaining it's gaining popularity now. So in in developer surveys, we see that it is right up there in some of the most in some of the most loved languages, as well as uh, right there right up there with one of the most wanted languages. Does not eliminate 100% runtime errors. Yep, it does not because it has to cater for the dynamism of JavaScript. Uh, it does not guarantee that it will. Plus, errors could arise at runtime because TypeScript only checks the code at compile time. So errors arising at runtime, TypeScript is not responsible for that. Uh, complicated error messages sometimes, but nothing that a Stack Overflow search couldn't solve. Difficult initial setup and migration. This is usually is largely taken care of because of the uh, popularity and adoption rate. So uh, m major frameworks and libraries usually, usually have TypeScript support out of the box. Uh, migration is easy enough because uh, TypeScript can type check your existing JavaScript code. So if you install TypeScript and enable the compiler option to check your JavaScript code, it can check you for that. And then you can move on from that step introduce types in your code. Um, does not obviate the need for testing code reviews. It does not. It does not claim to be. You still need to follow best practices. You te need to test your code. Um, other tools available. Prop types and flow are specific to React. JS doc is a comment-based type system. Uh, I would love to hear anyone you currently using JS doc, how they maintain their uh, maintain their typings, but I don't think any of these tools compare, come close to even, to, they don't even come close to TypeScript. Uh, lastly, people complain that it, devi it is deviating too much from JS. Uh, some of the features that TypeScript introduced early on uh, are now part of the standard. So classes are now part, async await are now part, plus the TypeScript team is working closely with TC39. So for example, all these stage three, com uh, all stage three proposals are now getting into TypeScript. So for example, two days back, TypeScript 3.7 was launched and it already has null coalescing and uh, optional chaining, which will be added to JavaScript sometime next year. So, um, to conclude, so should we just I guess ditch JavaScript now. Uh, maybe rename our uh, meetup to Exchange TS. Uh, I don't know, uh, but it gives us a lot of, I guess, productivity bonus, at, both as a developer, and it really shines uh, when it comes to communicating with the team. Um, I consider it more as an extension of JavaScript. It builds on top of it, and uh, more like a DLC than a standalone game. So. Uh, yeah, and I can promise you that once you start using TypeScript, you're never 
going to use JavaScript again. Maybe you can use it in your, uh, in your personal projects. I still use JavaScript, but when it comes to uh, working in teams and reading other people's code, I am not diving into that without TypeScript. So, yeah, that concludes my talk. TypeScript in all of our projects, so JavaScript is not even an option, I guess. But if you are, I guess, well, you're transition. like transitioning. Um, I knew TypeScript when I joined, so, uh, and I joined recently, maybe Ian can, I think we should, we teach them and force them to use TypeScript, yeah, because we can. <laughs> yeah. We, we were small enough that it was easy to switch all of our developers to TypeScript, and it provided a lot of benefits, and then the only issue was kind of, Getting everything set up. 